If you don't know me, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here. I work with our students and our creative team. I'm excited to share God's Word with you today, too. Um, thank you for, for working with us in, in uh, this just kind of reset here. Now, um, the, some of you in this room were not alive at this point, but 99, 2000, 2001, we know it as the turn of the century, uh, Y2K, you remember everything. That was a really cool time that I got to grow up in. I was, I was about 13 years old, around the, 14 years old around that time. And some really cool things were happening in my world of like food. Like, do you guys remember the Heinz Easy Squirt? Like, we had green ketchup and purple ketchup. You remember this? Like, on our fries, we put, like, radioactive green on them, which I'm sure will result in cancer later in life for me. Um, there also was different, uh, different, like, soda flavors were really starting to, to come out rather than just cola. There was, like, lemon Coke and lemon Pepsi and, and all these different flavors. Now Mountain Dew, you just go to the store, and there's, like, 19 different flavors of Mountain Dew. That all kind of started around that time. Uh, also, uh, restaurant and uh, organization or business uh, kind of, fu- not necessarily fundraisers, but more uh, sweepstakes, things, things like that, like McDonald's Monopoly. It was, it was really at its peak at that point. Do you remember this? We'd go and we'd get the peel-offs. We'd order that, you know, supersized fry and get like to get two peels instead of one. Um, and none of us will ever win. We now know because of documentaries and stuff, it was rigged the whole time. None of us were ever going to win. But we got that free fry and that made it worth it. I don't know if you remember, remember doing that. But McDonald's wasn't the only one that, that did that. Uh, in 1999, Healthy Foods, or Healthy Choice Foods and Snacks, I don't know if you're familiar with that brand, they launched a promotion that allowed customers to redeem barcodes from the things that they bought for frequent flyer miles. And if you're unaware of what that is, if you fly with the organization long enough, like American Airlines, which was the partnership here, you get uh, free flights or you get perks and benefits. And so you, you are able to get frequent flyer miles by scanning the barcodes and, and getting, getting things from um, uh, Healthy Choice. And a guy, in, and as always, somebody's going to figure out a way to rig the system. And this guy named David Phillips lives in California. Uh, he soon found a way to kind of game the promotion when he realized that uh, it wasn't just the giant frozen meals or dinners that had those codes on them, but it was every single pudding cup. Meaning that you could go and buy a six-pack of pudding cups and you get six times the amount of barcodes rather than just the one. And so he's a smart guy, uh, way cheaper than buying frozen meals. And so he bought over 12,000 pudding cups. 12,000 pudding cups from wherever he could find them. People started calling him the pudding guy for obvious reasons. He seemed like a, a, really, like a hoarder of, of pudding, like really weird. I don't know why somebody would do that. And so it was confusing, but for obvious reasons, he was the pudding guy. Um, and his plan worked. He, in the end, he earned 1.3 million frequent flyer miles, the equivalent of 30 flights around the entire world, and a lifetime platinum status with American Airlines. And th- guess how much he spent to do it? Only $3,000. $3,000. To now fly around the world to this day, wherever he wants and whenever he wants. $3,000 to do that. So he didn't have to go like $100,000 in debt or nothing crazy. It was, it was super simple. Here, here's why I'm telling you this. David, um, David Phillips didn't actually care about the pudding at all. In fact, he, he didn't even keep the pudding. He donated it to the Salvation Army. He didn't even keep it. Now, I, I personally love tapioca pudding. Does anyone in here else love tapioca pudding? Okay, I'm going to give a couple of these away just because I don't want to... Um, my wife is not a huge fan that, uh, of this. Who else wants one? Anybody? Anyone? Here you go, Brecken. There you go. Don't drop that. Thanks. Um, I was eating uh, some of this yesterday, and my wife looked at me really gross, so apparently I've got to get it out of the house. She's not a huge fan of tapioca. But he, he donated all that. He didn't actually, didn't actually want it. But he was, by, he was the pudding guy by all measurables that we could see. He was buying it. He talked about it. This is what he focused on. And it seemed like the dude loved his pudding. But for David, uh, the pudding was just a means to an end for him. A, 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 for him, the pudding was just a convenient method to get what he really wanted, which was the frequent flyer miles. And here's, here's why, I'm, why I'm going through this. Hear me. For those of us that call ourselves Christians... It's very easy for us to begin treating our relationship with God like pudding. Just a means to an end. And this is often why non-church people get turned off by the church. 
where our, our kind of faith and our religiosity isn't about making much of Him or praising His name or lining our lives up to look as much like Jesus as possible, but rather following Jesus is just kind of a nice moral framework for us. Like we already kind of lean towards that, that morality, so it just works for us, and so that's what we do. And if we're really honest, if we're really honest, I know it's church, but if we're really honest, our faith can easily be more um, or Honestly, it can be about or really be, be born out of just convenience and comfortability. Because the moment we are inconvenienced and uncomfortable, what comes out? What we really believe. And so how much of what we believe and the faith that we adhere to is just based on comfortability and convenience? And honestly, I think this shows itself no, no more evident than in our prayer life. We don't, uh, we don't, maybe this is you, you don't pray often, but when we do, it is when we are inconvenienced and when we are uh, uncomfortable and we have those intrusive thoughts like, God, why are you doing this to me? You owe me this. Why are you doing this? Or, or I've been doing all this down here for you. Why can't you just fill in the blank? And these are what I would call pudding prayers. Praying is just a means to an end to get something that I really want. And as James finishes up his entire letter today, he's not going to poke us like in the nose like he has been throughout this, this whole, whole letter, but he's actually going to encourage us. Uh, Pierce taught last week was kind of just a shift in his approach to the, the people that are reading it and, and us today. But he's going to encourage us to something better than just our, our pudding prayers. And as for the Christian, um, and, and for the Christians in the room, before you just tune me out and you're like, oh man, the preacher's preaching on uh, prayer again, surprise, big surprise, I can just kind of roll my eyes back and tune this out. Before you do that, I want, you, I want you to consider this question right here, is if you believed that your prayers actually did something, how would it actually change how you pray? If you believed that your prayers actually did something, if they would result in something meaningful and weren't just about you getting something that you feel you deserve from God, how would that change your approach to prayer? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And so I want you to see some of this for yourself. Um, and I want you to go ahead and turn to James 5 with me as we finish up his letter. And if you don't have a Bible and aren't opening up that, you can, you can scroll to it on your phone, or you can grab one of those hardback black Bibles in the seats in front of you. Page 980 in those. Um, and if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that. Uh, that's our gift to you. We'd love for you to have a Bible at home. But again, today as we, we wrap up this entire series, um, we're going to see how much you guys remember, and it's not like a, a big test. These are pretty simple things that are repeated throughout the whole series. But James, uh, he, he's a leader in a church in Jerusalem, and he's writing to Christians scattered around the known world at the time. And uh, he's using a lot of words from his big brother, who is? Jesus, Jesus is always the easy answer, okay? It's not going to be for the rest of this, but that's always the easy answer. Yes, Jesus is his big brother, and he's taking wisdom from one of Jesus' most famous sermons, which is? Sermon on the Mount. See, we're getting better. This is good. And so he's taking wisdom from those, and he's, he's kind of pointing out a few things, and he's, he's basically saying where our words and where our actions don't line up, we're living fractured. Yes, we're living fractured. Somebody got it. Um, you, you get a pudding cup at the end, okay? Where, where our words and our actions don't line up, we're living fractured. We're showing our world this fractured picture of Jesus and his kingdom. And so James uses the wisdom of Jesus and some of his ancestors to encourage us in our faith, uh, to, to push us in our works, and to encourage us along in the journey toward what? Oh man, nobody. Wholeness. Wholeness. And now you're like, oh yeah, that's what I was going to say, but you didn't say it, all right? No pudding cup for you. It's when our beliefs and our actions line up, when they're whole, or as James says, when they're perfect. Just like the lights. Now today, uh, never mind, I take it back. Um, now, today's passage is considered, uh, at the end here, it's considered one of the most controversial or more difficult in the New Testament and more difficult, especially in the book of James, probably the most difficult in James. And so, uh, just going in, I want to be clear that you will come away with questions, 
you will come away with questions, and we're going to try to answer some of those today, but we can't get to all of them because uh, our kid story leaders would murder me, and many of you would start to leave because it would get in time for the Super Bowl. So uh, it, it would just take a long time to go through all of it, and we're not going to do all that today. But let's read a bit together and see how we come out on the back end, okay? Um, we're going to start in verse 13 of James 5. He's wrapping up. He says this, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray for them and anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let's stop there. Did you grasp all of that? Did you come out on the back end, no questions, I've got it? If you come out that way, you're probably not paying attention. See, part of this sounds really good, and part of it sounds really confusing. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at three questions that come up from this passage. And this week, we're going we're gonna to go over a couple more. And if you have questions that we don't get to, please let me know. But we're going to go over a couple more in a podcast this week. New Story Podcast, wherever you get your podcast, it'll come out this week. And we're going to talk about a few more of these questions from this passage. But I want to hit just a few this morning in our time that we have. And the first question is really key to unlocking the rest of it. And it's, it's this right here in verse 15. Um, and the first question is this, what is a prayer offered in faith? What is a prayer offered in faith? How many of you had this question? You're like, ah, prayer offered in faith. What is he talking about? Simply put, if you want to write this down, you can. Simply put, a prayer offered in faith is a request to God, trusting him with the outcome. It's a request made to God, just trusting him with the outcome, whatever that may be. And a super important note on this, and, and we'll talk about this more shortly. But look at me, this type of prayer does not guarantee the outcome that you want. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. One of the most damaging things that, that have been said or taught by people in my position and look a lot like me sitting up on stages and talking, talking about pastors is, is that if they've told you because God did not answer your prayers because you didn't have enough faith. Have you heard that before? Maybe you've been told that before? Maybe that's been you and you were crushed because you were told that if you had exercised just a little bit more faith then surely God would have healed your mom. If you had a little bit more faith, God would have filled the crib. If you prayed just a little bit more, with a little bit more faith, God would have stopped your parents from getting a divorce or the bullying would have stopped. See, a prayer offered in faith is not some just unwavering, conf unshakable confidence that He will do exactly what I ask of Him in the way that I want or think he should if he did do that in the way that i think he should in the way i want him to what is my faith really in it's in the outcome that i want and it's not in him that's important note on this so a prayer offered in faith is not some unwavering confidence but it's a trust that no matter the outcome he's working it for my good and his glory do you see the difference in this one is motivated by what I want, and the other is a posture that we take. So rather, it's rather, if I had a little bit more faith, God would do this. It's, I know that God is working for my good and his glory, no matter the outcome. That's the posture we take. Jen Wilkin, uh, she's a, a theologian and, and an author. She, she said it this way. It's very simple. The prayer offered in faith is a faith not in a particular outcome, but in the God of all outcomes. You with me so far? Now, let's look back at verse 15. Now we have kind of an understanding of this. Verse 15, James continues, and he says something pretty big. I'll put it up on the screen, but always look at your Bible, make sure I'm not making stuff up, okay? Verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. This brings up a big question. Is James saying what I think he's saying? Is James saying, that, that like, does a prayer like this promise healing? Is that what James is saying? Like if I got the black lung from one day down in the coal mines, I can just pray over it and bam, that's gone? Some of you get the reference. Is it that easy? No. Well, if it's not guaranteed, then what, what in the world is James on here? What is he talking about? 
Listen, there are times that God will grant healing in response to our prayers, yes. But it can't mean every time, and you've lived enough life to know this is true. Some see what James wrote as this divine guarantee. If I just pray in confidence and I speak it, but it can't mean that. Because we've lived enough life to see that not happen. So here's what I want to challenge all of us with. What if God knows better than us? What, what, if, what if the healing we need isn't physical, but it's actually spiritual? What if the, what if the cure we're praying for here, or out here, what if the, the cure we're praying for out here it, it, it isn't what God is trying to heal in here? See, if our prayers are about having enough faith and, and then we can, we can all this different stuff and we can get the outcome we want, um, if our prayers are about not, sorry, I'm clever, if our prayers are not about having enough faith to get the outcome we want but are actually about us trusting the God of all outcomes, what James is saying here begins to come together. Because our prayers do something. When we trust the one of all outcomes, our prayers do something, but more often than not, it is something done within us rather than in our world. And like Pierce said last week, James is really trying to shift our perspective from what is happening to us to what is God is forming in us. And so as we sit with our loved ones, and it seems like time is running out, when our parents won't, won't stop fighting, what do we do? We pray with a faith that says, won't he do it? With a posture that says, even if he doesn't. We pray with a trust in our God that says, I know he can, I know he is able, I know it's possible, but a posture that says, even if he doesn't do it, praise his name. In the end, the blood of Jesus heals all of our diseases, all of our dysfunction. Even if God doesn't heal us this side of eternity, he will next. J.D. Greer says it this way. He says, he hears every prayer and will one day wipe away every tear. And so in a sense, yeah, God does guarantee healing even if it's not according to the exact timetable that we want him to. Won't he do it? But even if he doesn't, praise his name. But James isn't done here. Look at verse 15 again, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, back us up a little bit. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they sin, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Listen, there is a, a, a lot of verbiage in that passage right there about forgiveness and healing. And so you're probably asking, okay, th this question right here, are sin and sickness, are sin and sickness connected in some way? None of these questions are a super easy answer, especially this one. And so again, we need to be careful with this. The reason we get sick is the, the curse of sin in our world, just simply flat as that. But this doesn't mean that the sickness that you're experiencing is a result of something you did and now God is punishing you. But simply that sin in general in our world brought that to earth. It's part of the curse. If we want to read more on that, go back to Genesis 3. So we shouldn't be quick to diagnose on this. Like we're checking, uh, checking our, 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 you know, someone's temperature and we say, yeah, your 102 temperature um, is because you lied to your parents about where you were at last Friday. Oof. Or you get your CAT scan and you say, see that mass right there? It's because you cheated on your taxes. We need to be careful about diagnosing things like that. We can't and we shouldn't make assumptions like this connecting the two. Jesus uh, cautioned his disciples on this when they saw a blind man and they're like, okay, who done it? Him or his parents? Because somebody sinned here to make that happen. He cautioned them on that. But, there's always a but in this, some sickness can be a part of God's discipline. And so it is good to practice a little self-examination when you get in those moments. Sometimes through our sickness, God may be trying to get at the core of our pride. Because I, I don't know about you, when I'm sick, I start to see life a little bit more clearly. When I'm, when I'm actually healthy, I think I'm going to live forever. 
but the slightest scratch in my throat, and I'm like, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm joking, kind of, uh, but I actually got sick this week in preparation for this. I'm like, I guess the Lord's just trying to teach me lessons as I do this. And as I lay there compl- contemplating my life and having an existential crisis, it's a good time for self-examination. There may be times when God is trying to get your attention, and if and when we become aware of specific sins that we have not been repenting of, man, we pray. And we repent because what's more important than the healing from our sickness that we get is finding forgiveness and new life in Jesus. Less important than your body being healed is your soul being saved. And if God uses your sickness to bring salvation to your soul, praise His name. See, every single person, you may not know this, but every single person that Jesus cured in the Bible died. That's why we don't see them today. That may be new information. Every single person that Jesus cured in the Bible died. So his focus was always less on the cure and more on the healing of their soul. And that's the point. And so James finishes that verse. And he's reminding us of of why we pray. And he he says this. He says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is why we pray. We pray because it's powerful and effective. And don't miss this. Our prayers are not powerful and effective because of our righteousness, because of our goodness. They are powerful and effective because of His. You know that? It's not that you become a lot better person and you become more righteous and probably more self-righteous than anything. And suddenly your prayers will mean more. No, they're only powerful and effective because of His goodness, His righteousness. And you may not be righteous at all, and spoiler alert, in fact, you you are not. But if you are surrendered to Jesus, you have someone praying on your behalf who is. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus. And James says, you want an example of how powerful this can be? Want an example of how powerful prayer can be? When we're praying with faith in the God of all outcomes, well, it gives the example of Elijah. And for time, we won't go in depth on what all that story is that he's referring to. We'll do that on the podcast this week, so please go listen to that. But the whole thrust is, hey, you're not you're not necessarily supposed to mimic the the uh, miracle that he did, but you are supposed to mimic his faith. So that story can show you. Just how powerful your prayers can be. Now, I want you to see how he wraps up this section. And he ends this whole letter. This is crescendo. The plane has landed. It's taxiing now to the gate. And he wants to remind us of why we are here. So look at verse 19. It says, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, Someone should bring that person back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. James ends his letter. They spend all this time writing, thinking about the people around him who need Jesus and the people around you who need Jesus. And in the context of prayer, he he, he says this. of, Of all the things, or well, in the context of prayer, we'll ask this. Of all the things you are praying for right now, how many of them involve people who need Jesus? Or are all of our prayers putting prayers? About getting the outcome that we want. Lord, help me get this job. Lord, get me that spouse. Lord, fix this. Lord, heal this. There's nothing wrong with wanting those things. But if that's it, are we also praying for those that need Jesus, who, who need the healing only Jesus can bring? J.D. Greer asked this question. It was fantastic. He said, if tonight God answered all the prayers you prayed last week, right now, answered all of them that you prayed last week, how many new people would be in the kingdom tomorrow? Do you feel that? Let me uh, maybe illustrate this way. 2013. Back in Nam, for some of you. Way back in the day. WestJet Airlines in Canada 
ran a, a TV campaign, uh, which they had, had filmed uh, real passengers, real passengers who, as they scanned their boarding pass to get on the plane, they had the option of chatting with this virtual Santa. And this virtual Santa was a live stream with a real Santa in a studio, and so he could interact with them. It wasn't just like a cartoon, it was a real person. And if they said yes to the virtual Santa, they, they could, the Santa would ask them, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And it's cute for the kids, and the kids are saying all kinds of different stuff, and it seemed random and weird for adults a little bit, and so they'd say big screen TV or, or a camera or, or something like that. And they'd answer, and then they'd go on through the security line uh, to their gates. But what they didn't know is that once they got those requests, WestJet, the airline, sent people to buy Christmas presents at their destination city so that when they got off the plane and they stood the luggage belt, all their luggage came down, but also all the presents they requested wrapped with their name on it came down on the luggage line. Everything that they had asked for for Christmas. And it was a great advertisement. This is a beautiful thing. You, should watch, you, you can look it up if you go search WestJet uh, Christmas or Santa or something like that. You can, you can, see, you can see this, and it, it's actually pretty, pretty beautiful. But I always felt bad for one guy in the commercial. Because when Santa asked him what he wants, he said, honestly, socks and underwear not realizing what he was being offered in that moment. And so as they are all standing by the luggage belt and you're watching these people pick up widescreen TVs and iPads and golf clubs, this dude gets socks and some tidy whities Why am I telling you this? Because do you realize what you are being offered through prayer? Personally, I don't want to get to heaven with just socks and tidy whities in my hand. I want to take as many people with me as possible. People that have pleaded on behalf of. What about you? Are our prayers just putting prayers to get what we want, a means to an end? Or do we pray with a faith? that says, won't he do it, in a posture that says, even if he doesn't, I'll praise his name. Let me close our, uh, today and, and our entire series um, with, with this. One of the most um, influential uh, black uh, preachers in history, his name was William Seymour. And he was a pastor at Azusa, Azusa Street in California in 1905. And they said that when they were in the meetings, uh, William would sit in the front row with some orange crates stacked up like this. And while the worship was going on, he'd sit with his head in the crate. And he would sit, and he'd pray, and he would wait. And he'd wait to hear from God. And when he felt like he got a word from God, he would put the crate down and he would get up and he would speak. They, were, they said sometimes he, he didn't even, he, he would just keep his head in the crate the whole time it wouldn't get up. Some services, that's just where he stayed. And the reason he did that and sometimes he didn't get out because he did not want to say anything or do anything that was out of step with him. And I believe God is looking for a people and looking to work through a church that would just pray and say, God, would you work? God, would you move? Now, you don't have to stick your head in an orange crate. But you can have the posture and pray with the posture of faith in the God of all outcomes, whatever it may be. As James has pushed us and challenged us in our faith, in our works, in our journey toward making those things line up, our journey to wholeness, my prayer is that we wouldn't want to do anything on our own strength or anything in our own power because we know who is really powerful and effective. So 
So it takes us back to the question that we started today with. If you believed that your prayers did something, how would it change your prayer life? If you believed your prayers did something, how would it change your prayer life? God has given us prayer to bring his kingdom here on this earth. And I believe God can make it in KC as it is in heaven because there is a church called New Story that is praying and interceding to a very powerful and faithful God. Are you using that? Church, do you realize what is being offered to us? Look around you and look at the brokenness around you. Look at the prayer. Your, your prayers can heal the sick. Your prayers can change and alter someone's eternity. Your prayers can restore and redeem and renew. And I pray we are not satisfied to just stand at the luggage rack, which is tidy whities and socks in our hands. Are our prayers just putting prayers? Is our faith just a putting faith focused on doing what I, 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 you know, I feel like I should do so I can get what I feel like I deserve? Is our faith one of William Seymour? He says, I don't want to move out of step from you. I don't want to create more fractures. I want to live whole. Where are you at on that? That's what I'll leave us with, with the series in James. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for the little brother of your son, James. Thank you for his faithfulness in writing what is a formative book for us as followers of Jesus. One that challenges us, yes, in our faith and yes, in our works and how our lives line up with what you've called us to do. Thank you that your word is active. Thank you that it, 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 it kind of hits us where we need it to. I pray that we wouldn't be satisfied with just leaving here unchanged or even a desire to change or steps to make a change. We wouldn't treat it just like a normal Sunday or we just get up and we leave and we walk out. But God, hit us with the reality of why we're here. Hit us with the reality that, that, that we, we, what our, our experience here, our life here is so short. We're not satisfied praying putting, praying, putting prayers to get certain things that won't last beyond our last breath. God, we just want to make much of your name today. Give us a faith that says, won't you do it? and a posture and a settledness that says, even if you don't, I'll still praise you. God, give us that today. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.